It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Jan Hagel. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for participating in this webinar today. It's the first not only of the summer series, but it's actually our very first webinar. FICA has been providing live resources on local, regional, and national level since its first national conference in 1998. And we're now pleased to be able to provide live learning programs via long distance technology so that many more participants will be able to benefit. It's only fitting that our first presenter for this inaugural program is Dr. Doug Ball. Dr. Ball has generously been a regular contributor and leader of many sessions in FICA programs over the years. He is a practicing endocrinologist at Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions. As we know, he is a strong advocate for patients' understanding of their disease, specifically how it affects them as well as their options, as any of his patients would attest to. On a professional level, Dr. Ball is a foremost thyroid cancer expert, having authored many publications on the topic, presented at many professional medical meetings, and regularly participates in clinical research in thyroid cancer. What most of us patients don't realize is that much of his research, there is also much research that goes on behind the scenes before the clinical research um, comes into play. And at his institution at Johns Hopkins, he is one of a team of researchers that includes Barry Nelkin, who they are recent recipients of a part of American Cancer Society's MEN2 Thyroid Consortium Awards. And they are working on, and this is in the lab, preclinical, before there's any clinical trial um, information given, uh, developed, but it's very, very important, perhaps the most important, some of the most important preclinical research that's going on in decades to come. And they're hoping to identify predictive markers to be able to design personalized therapies for the treatment of medullary thyroid cancer and perhaps other thyroid cancers as time goes on. Today, however, Dr. Ball will be focusing on current treatment of people with persistent medullary thyroid cancer. Before I turn it over to him, I want to remind you to be sure to write your questions for me to ask Dr. Ball. Don't be shy. However, please keep in mind that briefness is better. It's easier for us to ask the questions, that the information in the questions needs to be as general as possible so it will be of interest and usefulness to the the largest number of people in our audience. And also, please remember that any information that Dr. Ball is giving us today is not intended to be specific medical advice, but really general knowledge. And, it, and, and he urges you to remember that it is important to follow up with your own physician and your own medullary thyroid cancer specialist for help as it pertains to you. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Ball. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jan, for that introduction. Uh, looking at the list of participants, I see many, many familiar names, and this is this is really a, a pleasure and a thrill for me to be involved in this uh, webinar. And I thank Gary for setting it up. Uh, it's an it's a nice way for ITOG to expand its educational mission. Um, my uh, topic today is persistent medullary thyroid cancer: uh, choosing when and how to treat. And I'll spend uh, about 40 minutes with my part of the talk, and then we'll have 15 to 20 minutes remaining for your questions. And I request that you follow Jan's uh, guidelines uh, to make this as general as possible and to understand that I cannot give you uh, uh, specific uh, medical advice in, in this format, certainly. Um, one of the things that's important in a talk like this is um, that it be done in the in an up-and-up up, uh, fashion. And I, I want to disclose uh, some of the, consult, the consulting relationships that I have and also clinical trial um, uh, principal investigator roles that I have with these pharmaceutical companies. The, uh, the basics of medullary thyroid cancer, I think, are well known to many members of the group, but I'll review it just briefly for you. Um, medullary thyroid cancer stems from the calcitonin-producing thyroid cells. These are a minority uh, population in the thyroid gland. MTC accounts for only 3 to 4% of thyroid cancers. 
Uh, this is about 1,700 to perhaps 2,000 cases per year in the United States. And strikingly, medullary thyroid cancer is heritable in 25% of cases. We know that mutations in the RET gene cause familial medullary thyroid cancer. And it's important even for sporadic, that is, non-familial patients to know a little bit about RET, the RET gene. So uh, here are some important facts to know. RET gene mutations are seen in the tumors of about half of MTC patients. All of the hereditary patients and about 40% of the non-hereditary patients. Um, these mutations cause the RET protein to be overactive. And in a minute, I'll tell you the consequences of that overactivity. RET mutations in a tumor can be associated with a higher rate of metastasis and even a higher rate of going on to death from medullary thyroid cancer. So it is an important prognostic marker. Um, interestingly, in the patients sick enough to go into medullary thyroid cancer clinical trials, 75 to 80 percent of them have a RET gene mutation in their tumors. So this is a striking overrepresentation compared to the 40 percent uh, seen in, in all comers. And it reemphasizes how important these RET mutations are in the prognosis in medullary thyroid cancer. Now, RET mutations can be seen and detected in the blood and in the tumors, and commercial laboratories can do this work. The American Thyroid Association, in its 2009 MTC guidelines, did not recommend routine testing of tumors. However, blood testing for RET mutations is recommended. Um, they commented that um, currently RET mutation results do not contribute to treatment decisions, but that tumor testing could become important if treatments show specific activity for RET mutation positive or RET mutation negative patients. But so far, clinical trials have not shown different response rates with and without the RET mutation. And that's an important fact to know and maybe a little counterintuitive, I think. Now, um, the background information that's very important is the natural history of medullary thyroid cancer. And put another way, we could say, how do medullary thyroid cancers do? How, how do medullary thyroid cancer patients do with the traditional treatments of surgery alone or perhaps surgery plus radiation in some cases? And the, uh, the flippant answer is that the disease is very heterogeneous. And I think people that have participated in in the FICA medullary thyroid cancer group know this, that there are many different experiences with MTC, some of which are um, uh, kind of a speed bump on life's uh, road and some of which are truly um, challenging in every way. So um, it's important to know kind of the variation in the baseline natural history. Now, we know that the clinical stage has a major role in determining how people do. The best data from this probably come from the United States SEER program, and this was published by Dr. Romans from Yale University in 2006. In, this, in these data, patients with tumors believed to be confined to the thyroid gland had a 10-year survival greater than 95%. So these patients did as well as patients with the common form of thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer. Patients with involvement of both the thyroid gland and neck lymph nodes at presentation did slightly worse, with a 10-year survival of about 75%. And patients with distant metastasis at presentation did worse, with a 10-year survival of 40%. Now, understand that these are data from an older era. And um, we did not have any of the kinase inhibitors or other uh, drug therapies, and we also had much less effective uh, imaging and less effective surgery at that time. But this is sort of the baseline situation we're dealing with, that patients with tumors confined to the th thyroid gland do great. Patients with um, lymph node metastasis do somewhat less well, and patients with distant metastasis at the time of presentation have a greater challenge. Now, 
Calcitonin is worth paying attention to. It's really the, the biomarker that we use to establish whether there's persistent medullary thyroid cancer. Calcitonin levels are detectable in most healthy adults, but after thyroid removal, it becomes undetectable in patients who are in surgical remission. So the undetectable postoperative calcitonin is a hallmark of sur surgical remission, and an elevated calcitonin generally indicates that there is disease left in the body. Now, the disappearance rate of calcitonin may be prolonged. Six to eight weeks is fairly typical, but in some patients, the calcitonin still may be dropping at four to six months after surgery. It's useful to get multiple calcitonin levels during this early time period in order to establish the nadir, or low point, and to um, get an early idea of what the calcitonin doubling time may be. The impact of the calcitonin doubling time was well illustrated by a French group publishing in 2005. Um, and this was from a database that encompassed the entire French national experience. Um, French patients with a calcitonin doubling time greater than two years had excellent survival. In contrast, patients with a doubling time under six months had increased mortality. In most patients, the doubling time could be estimated within about two years of follow-up, uh, although in some patients the calcitonin results were chaotic, so that a doubling time couldn't really be accurately estimated. In this small figure uh, to the left, it shows the uh, main data in this paper. On the y-axis of this figure, uh, shown here, is the percentage of patients still alive. On the x-axis of the figure, shown here, is the years of follow-up. This um, line here represents the excellent survival of patients who um, had doubling times greater than two years. And this lower line here represents the increased risk of death in patients who had shorter calcitonin doubling times. And you can see that about half of them had died of their disease by about two and a half years. Now again, this is from an era well before uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So, uh, and um, the other, you know, limitations in medical care of that time in the in the uh, late 1900s. So um, uh, we are doing better than that now. But clearly, a rapid calcitonin doubling time is uh, a prognosis factor that uh, we need to pay attention to. CEA is a second tumor marker, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, um, but we look at the doubling time of CEA as well as calcitonin. Now, we know uh, pretty well where uh, medullary thyroid cancer can go when it leaves the thyroid gland. The most important site is the neck lymph nodes, and a majority of patients do have lymph node involvement. When the disease has gone to lymph nodes, it makes it difficult to cure surgically. So the majority of patients with lymph node involvement will still have a persistent calcitonin elevation even after surgery, which includes lymph node resection. A second important site are lymph nodes in the chest, especially in the central chest, called the mediastinum. Medullary thyroid cancer can also go to the lung tissue, to the liver, where it's particularly difficult to detect with uh, scanning and to bone, where it can also be difficult to detect. So really, these are the main uh, sites that we have to look for for persistent or uh, progressive disease. Um, the American Thyroid Association has um, provided a useful guideline, uh, which includes the recommended choices for imaging in medullary thyroid cancer. And I really support these choices. These are available to you online as well through the American Thyroid Association website, and that is indicated uh, at the bottom of this slide. For calcitonin levels less than 150, the ATA recommends just neck ultrasound, um, that it's relatively futile do doing, in most patients, a, uh, uh, an imaging uh, exercise for patients with low levels of persistent calcitonin elevation. If the calcitonin is higher, though, it's useful to add in 
next CT or MRI, which would show the deeper lymph node areas in the neck, chest CT looking at the lung and mediastinum, an MRI or CT of the abdomen done with a liver protocol to detect liver metastases. And this is more sensitive than a typical um, abdominal CT without that um, distinction. And then MRI of the spine and pelvis, or perhaps a bone scan to pick up bone metastases. So this is the set of imaging that's recommended. Note, note that PET CT is not on this list. Um, it's pretty good in several of these areas, but not as good as these more targeted studies. So in general, we don't use a lot of PET CT scans in medullary thyroid cancer. Um, for routine surveillance, every six months we like to get calcitonin CEA thyroid blood tests and usually a neck ultrasound. If the calcitonin is significantly elevated, then at Hopkins we usually get MRI of the neck, CT of the chest, liver protocol MRI, and often some form of bone imaging. Now this is one of the most important questions uh, to be asked in this talk, and, and really is the focus uh, here. At, at what level of progression do I need to seek an intervention? This is really the, the crux of the matter, I think. And it's, it's actually a very complex question. Um, there are many factors that um, bear on this. So uh, at first, uh, I think one needs to understand the current disease burden, you know, sort of a cross-sectional view of where you are right now. But you also need the rate of progression, not just the cross-sectional view, but a, a, a view that takes into account time and some understanding of the natural history of the disease if it's left untreated. Um, factoring into this is the impact of better imaging technology. So if you look harder and more sensitively, you will probably see more things. And you have to distinguish between true progression and apparent progression that comes from looking harder or more effectively. Another class of um, factors bearing on this is, am I having symptoms now? Patients who are actively symptomatic, there's, there's a pretty strong reason to um, consider treatment. Um, one needs to understand the effectiveness of the treatment options and their toxicity, which can be pretty significant. And then one finally needs to carefully weigh the value of anticipated benefit. Um, can the proposed therapy actually increase survival? Or is it a lesser benefit, delaying the time to progression? Or lesser still, does it just um, cause some shrinkage on CAT scans without an anticipation of delayed time to progression? So these are sort of decreasing levels of clinical benefit. Now, how is disease progression measured. I think the way it's done in clinical trials is very helpful because it's a, a formal way that the National Cancer Institute has devised. And I, I think it helps us to think in these terms in order to be kind of specific about what progression really means. Now, the, um, the National Cancer Institute has instituted what are called RESIST criteria for cancer clinical trials. And really, the entire world has now adopted these there are different categories of, um, of disease in patients on a clinical trial. So the best, of course, is complete response, disappearance of all the target lesions. A partial response is defined at least 30% reduction in the sum of the long diameter of all the lesions compared to the baseline before treatment. Progressive disease, on the other hand, is at least a 20% increase in the sum of these long diameters, or new measurable lesions. And patients who don't qualify in these three groups are considered um, to have stable disease. All right, so this is sort of a useful framework to think about what is significant progression with uh, at least a 20% increase in the sum of long diameters over some defined time period as being considered significant progression. Now, I'd like to present you with sort of a generalized case 
to think uh, together with you about whether it is time for systemic therapy. Um, this is a 50-year-old woman who had medullary thyroid cancer surgery nine years ago. She underwent thyroidectomy, central and right lateral neck dissections. Her pathology revealed a 1.8 centimeter, a relatively small, right lobe medullary thyroid cancer, and four out of the 25 lymph nodes were positive. She had a low calcitonin level after um, surgery, but you can see in these tiny dots here that over a short period of time, about a year, it doubled um, several times. The calculated doubling time in retrospect was only three months. At that point, she got reoperation and then radiation therapy, and the calcitonin level plateaued. Um, but then it started rising again. She got another surgery here, but it rose again. And again, over this longer period of time, the calcitonin doubling time was again about three months, indicating a concerning prognosis. I saw her first nine years after the initial surgery. At that time, a neck MRI revealed a two centimeter mass behind the trachea. There was also a four centimeter mass alongside the trachea. That's the windpipe, of course. And there was a right lateral neck node. She also had newly discovered metastases in the cervical spine and a two centimeter lymph node in the central chest, the mediastinum. And there was also bone metastasis to the thoracic spine although her bone scan was negative. And I've, by asterisk, I've shown the lesions that increased over a six-month time period. So is it time for systemic therapy? Well, this patient had locally aggressive disease that had been a refractory to both surgery and radiation. She had distant metastases with short-term progression. She had an adverse prognosis related to the calcitonin doubling time and her, uh, finally, her tumoral RET mutation status was unknown. In these situations, I usually ask myself, can we predict an adverse outcome in a three to five year time frame if the patient is left untreated? And I think here we clearly can. So th this is the kind of patient who would, uh, I think, definitely be referred for um, uh, a systemic therapy. And in this day and era, it's usually a, uh, an oral kinase inhibitor. Now there's been a lot of excitement about this category of drugs and I want to step back and review for you what are kinase inhibitors and what do they do. So these are drugs that, in, that compete with ATP, which is the energy source of specific cellular enzymes which are called kinases. What are kinases anyway? These are cellular enzymes that work in larger signaling pathways. And at a, at a chemical level, they add a phosphate group to other proteins, often changing their activity. I'll explain that a little bit more now. Uh, what kind of signaling pathways are important in MTC cells? Well, RET, sitting at the cell membrane here, is a kinase that sends signals through other kinases, particularly MAP kinase, and PI3 kinase to promote cell growth, protein synthesis, cell survival, and also blood vessel development in surrounding blood vessels. So you can see that um, RET sends signals down through these two pathways, as well as others, to achieve these effects. Um, can we inhibit RET specifically? Well, not totally specifically, no because um, so far, drugs that inhibit RET will also inhibit other kinases, including the VEGF receptors. And this is very fortuitous, I think, because VEGF is the major stimulator of tumor blood vessel development, as well as normal blood vessel regulation. So it has toxicity, but it also has promise for treatment. This next slide is busy, but you can just see the close approximation of RET and VEGF receptor on the similarity tree of human kinases. Um, there are many drugs that inhibit collections of kinases, and we refer to them as multi-kinase inhibitors. And on this list, with uh, this is an alphabetical listing that doesn't indicate any priority, 
Um, these drugs have all been tested in medullary thyroid cancer. The numbers on the table indicate the uh, concentration of the drug that in the laboratory gives 50% inhibition of these main kinases like VEGF receptor 2 and RET. So a lower number is better. And you can see that most of the drugs that inhibit RET will also inhibit VEGF receptors and also certain other receptors listed here. So that sort of the, the chemical potential of these drugs to do the kind of work that we'd like them to do. I'd now like to give you some highlights of important recent medullary thyroid cancer clinical trials. Um, Vandetinib is a drug that many of you have heard of. It has a new brand name from AstraZeneca called Caprelsa. Dr. Wells um, reported a uh, phase three double-blind clinical trial in which vandetinib was randomized versus placebo in 331 patients worldwide. In this study design, open-label use of vandetinib was allowed at the time of progression. This was an important decision because it made it unlikely that significant results could be obtained for overall survival. The main endpoint of the study was what's called progression-free survival. This is the fraction of patients that are alive and without progressive disease at a given time point. And the pro progression-free survival, or PFS, was markedly increased for vandetinib versus placebo. And this was the main result looked at by the FDA. The overall response rate was 45% and all of these were partial responses. There were no complete responses. As I said, the study provided no data on overall survival. There were significant adverse reactions, including diarrhea, rash, nausea, fatigue, and hypertension. These were the most common reactions. And then there were some rarer, more serious reactions as well. Um, these are the data um, that the FDA um, analyzed that were the, one of the main factors in the approval of the drug. This um, graph shows progression-free survival on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So a higher line here means that more patients were free of progression at a given time, and a lower line, fewer patients were free of progression. And this is the line for vandetinib. This is the line for the placebo. And you can see at a time point, um, such as 12 months, you can see that um, there was a significantly improved percentage of patients who were progression-free on vendetinib versus uh, patients on placebo. Not quite a, a doubling of patients who were progression-free. So, a very strong result. Um, another drug uh, in this class is XL184, also known as cabozantinib. These are pretty awkward names to use sometimes. Um, Dr. Kurzrock at MD Anderson, in collaboration with us and some other sites, um, studied 34 patients with medullary thyroid cancer treated in an expansion cohort, orig cohort originally from a phase one clinical trial. Um, the overall uh, response rate was 41%, and 29% were confirmed independently on repeat. 68% of the patients had either a confirmed um, partial response or stable disease lasting more than six months. The adverse reactions in this study overlapped with vandetinib, including hand-foot syndrome, fatigue, increased pancreatic enzyme called lipase, and diarrhea. And a randomized phase three trial has now been uh, uh, completed in terms of its accrual and is, is maturing. The results are, are pending, and we should hear within a year, I think. Another uh, drug is sunitinib, or Sutent. Um, this is already FDA approved for kidney cancer. Dr. D'Souza and colleagues from University of Chicago reported a phase two trial in 23 MTC patients. 
35% of these patients had um, partial response, 57% had stable disease. But the adverse reactions for sunitinib are somewhat more severe, including fatigue, low white blood cell count, nausea, diarrhea, oral soreness, and hand-foot syndrome. Another drug in this category, serafinib or uh, Nexavar, um, was reported by the Ohio State Group. Somewhat disappointingly, only one out of 16 patients had a partial response. Eight out of 16 had stable disease with a median uh, progression-free survival shown here. Um, and then uh, Dr. Schlumberger in France reported a phase two study of motesinib um, in 91 MTC patients. Somewhat disappointingly, only 2% had partial response, but 40% had stable disease longer than 24 weeks. Then there are two uh, ongoing MTC phase two clinical trials to highlight, E7080 or lenvatinib. Um, this is a drug that um, uh, inhibits VEGF receptors, RET, and some other kinases. Um, the phase two trial in medullary thyroid cancer is fully accrued, and the results are pending, probably out within a year. And pizopinib or Votriant is an FDA-approved drug for kidney cancer. It also inhibits VEGF receptors and PDGFR. It's only a weak RET inhibitor. And a phase two trial is underway preliminarily with about 7% partial response and 57% stable disease. So I'd like to now give you some of my perspectives and summation of systemic therapy in MTC. I think there are encouraging early results, including significant response rates for vandetinib, XL184, and sunitinib. Um, so far, vandetinib has demonstrated increase in PFS. There are no survival data available yet for any drug, so we can't say with confidence that these uh, partial responses will extend to give patients longer survival. We know pretty clearly that progression on one agent does not preclude response to a second. This was especially well shown um, in the interim results on the XL184, where several patients treated with other kinase inhibitors uh, and, and progressing had responses to XL184. Um, so far, and somewhat disappointingly, the presence of a RET mutation is not predictive of whether or not a patient will respond to these drugs. Furthermore, we really don't know whether the key target of these drugs is RET, a VEGF receptor, or perhaps some other kinase or kinases in combination. And then the final thing that's important to know about is that you can access um, the availability of clinical trials through this NIH uh, website, uh, www.cancer.gov, and I encourage all of you to become familiar with that if you aren't already. Now, a little bit about the FDA approval of vandetinib. Um, this occurred uh, this past April and really was a, a landmark in, in medullary thyroid cancer and thyroid cancer as a whole. As I said, it was based on the phase three clinical trial data. The FDA approved indication is symptomatic or progressive medullary thyroid cancer in patients with unresectable, locally advanced, or metastatic disease. And those words are very carefully parsed, and I think they indicate um, in broad strokes the kind of patients who um, should be considered for vandetinib. As I mentioned, the new brand name is Caprelsa. Um, here are some important things that I think patients should know about vandetinib. It should really be reserved for MTC patients with progressive disease on scans or people with symptoms such as diarrhea, flushing, and bone pain due to medullary thyroid cancer. It's usually not appropriate for stable asymptomatic disease. And we usually do not consider it in patients who only have an elevated calcitonin but do not have progressive lesions that we can see on scans. Um, you know, those, those sorts of decisions have to be individualized, but I think the toxicity of vandetinib is such that we don't want people to be treated too early. 
there have been deaths linked to cardiac rhythms, to um, severe skin conditions, to lung disease, to heart failure, and to stroke. So if you treat a large number of patients with vandetinib, there, there will be deaths um, due to the drug. So it's important, I think, not to jump in prematurely. Um, vandetinib can be associated with an important EKG abnormality, long QT syndrome, or prolongation of the QT interval. This is a risk factor for serious cardiac rhythm problems and rarely for sudden death. Um, doctors prescribing vandetinib need to check carefully for potential drug interactions that could worsen this problem, and they need to follow EKGs on patients on vandetinib. Um, the drug is also excluded if pregnancy is possible. And um, finally, prescribers need to register with an online education program. Uh, so it can't be just written willy-nilly to any pharmacy. It requires this registration. And there is only a, a single online pharmacy um, where vandetinib can be released from. Uh, whoops. Um, there are several, in addition to the approved drug vandetinib, there are several nationwide clinical trial options for patients with advanced MPC, and this is updated as to now. Um, for phase two clinical trials, there's uh, an important pediatric trial for MTC using vandetinib at the NIH. The NIH also has a second trial that combines vandetinib with a chemotherapy drug called Velcade or bortezomib. In Boston, there is a uh, trial involving Everolimus, uh, another targeted agent against medullary thyroid cancer. The University of Wisconsin has an interesting trial involving lithium. And then pazopinib is still being studied at Johns Hopkins and at the Mayo Clinic, and perhaps a few other sites in the Mayo Consortium. There are also phase one clinical studies, um, an interesting approach that's acquiring some uh, enthusiasm now are immunotherapies for medullary thyroid cancer. And I think this is a topic to look for more of in the next uh, few years. Um, Anti-CEA vaccines are being developed, I believe, at Duke University, although that's not currently listed, and um, also at TGen in Phoenix, Arizona. There are also uh, a number of other phase one clinical trials, that is, first in human trials, that could be of interest in medullary patients and could be accessed through a comprehensive cancer center. So how can patients and advocates stay up to date? The most important is to network, and FICA is the best way, I think, to do that. Um, Cancer.gov is another uh, important source that actually has worldwide studies, not just United States. Um, one can consider having both an endocrinologist and an oncologist to get a balanced expertise, both in the natural history of medullary thyroid cancer and in the safe and appropriate use of these multi-kinase inhibitors. And then um, uh, by being affiliated with a comprehensive cancer center, one can get access to phase one clinical trial availability. Um, to close this um, portion of the talk, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Johns Hopkins Head and Neck Spore grant from the National Institutes of Health that has provided funding for me and my co-investigator, Dr. Nelkin, the American Cancer Society that uh, has a, a generous grant that uh, Jan mentioned, some individual research donors, and clinical trial funding for medullary thyroid cancer from Exelixis and ISI. I'd also like to highlight the important work of the International Thyroid Oncology Group. Steve Sherman at MD Anderson is the new president of ITOG, Bob Gagel, the outgoing president, and Dwight Vicks, the coordinator and secretary. And then, of course, to acknowledge uh, FICA for its support. So uh, at this point, I'll um, stop my uh, part of the presentation, and I'll um, welcome questions. Um, uh, and uh, Jan will serve as the moderator. Again, I'd like you to um, um, form these questions not as specific requests for medical advice, which I, I really cannot do in this format, but as uh, general questions that could be helpful to you, but also to 
other members of the group. And Jan will moderate this and, um, and ask the questions by, uh, by telephone to me. And then I'll answer them by telephone. And Jan can ask some follow-up questions uh, as needed. Thank you for that great presentation. Thanks, so, Jan. So actually, I wanted to just clarify something very quickly. You used the term natural history. Yes. Um, several times. And so I just wanted to briefly mention that that really is referring to what the natural course of the cancer would be in your body if untreated. Do you, well, do you yeah, I've used it in a slightly sloppy fashion, and thanks for calling me on that. Um, so strictly speaking, it's the disease and its untreated course. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly inhumane to watch people without, um, without basic treatment. So we we don't really know the untreated course. What we know a little bit more about is the course with just um, standard surgery and, in some cases, radiation. So I use that term, natural history, but it's a, it's a somewhat sloppy usage. So now we're going to start off with a question that really pertains to the, the crux of this presentation. So a patient who's been diagnosed rather recently in the last year or two, and they've had the th their total thyroidectomy and they've had their lymph node dissection, but during that surgery, some of the lesions, some of the cancer had to be left behind. There was some non-resectable disease left behind. So knowing that, knowing that, and, and now in view of this newly approved drug, Vandenitiv, is it time to is it time to still wait and watch, or is it time to jump off the fence and go after that known remaining cancer with using vandetinib? Okay. So um, the remaining disease is it is it in the neck or in the chest? Do we do we know that, Jim? Well, in this particular case, it is actually below the sternum. Okay. So. Um, a couple of points here. Um, patients with, I, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but I'll repeat myself, that patients with extensive lymph node disease um, generally don't have much of a chance of having it cured surgically. And um, certainly when it, it extends down into the chest, the mediastinum, um, that that surgery would not be curative. At best, it would be palliative, you know, either treating symptoms or preventing or, or slowing f future complications. So um, uh, that might be a situation where um, vandetinib could be uh, considered. I'd, I'd contrast, though, the information that you get just from a cross-sectional look you know, say the, the, the post-op scans from information that you get over time. Because um, medullary thyroid cancer can frequently be very indolent. Um, and um, you don't want to treat too soon and bring on side effects of treatment um, before it um, uh, would really be uh, necessary. So I think in most cases with uh, patients with um, uh, inoperable disease, either discovered at the time of surgery or shortly after surgery, in most cases it does make sense to repeat the scanning in the fashion that I suggested um, at some appropriate interval, whether it's four or six months or perhaps even shorter if there's concern and try to establish the rate of progression and establish the calcitonin doubling time after surgery. So, you know, vandetinib could be indicated here, but just on the basis of, of those inoperable lymph nodes alone, I would say it's, it's not indicated. You need a little bit more time-related information or progression-related information. Great, thank you. So here's another patient in, in a situation where many, many find themselves. They've had multiple surgeries and even radiation therapy, and they know that there has been, there, they know there's documented metastasis. Calcitonin is pretty, fairly high, around 19,000. And in fact, they have tried the vandetinib, but they, okay. had to, but they had to stop because 
of side effects such as dehydration. So the question is, what what next? Yeah. So um, so this patient has um, has medullary thyroid cancer with presumably with progression on scans. But let's just say for point of argument, yes, yes there is progression on scans. Yeah. Yeah. And there is um, and there is there are symptoms with diarrhea. It sounds like maybe the, the diarrhea actually got worse on Vandetinib and now they're again off of Vandetinib. What can they do? So um, the um, the the post Vandetinib options are a little bit limited right now and I think we we really need more. Um, uh, six or twelve months ago we had the option of having that patient go on the XL184 trial, but that is now closed to accrual. Um, there are a couple of more clinical trials that I indicated in the slide that are, are still open, and those would be possibilities including uh, pizopinib or everolimus. Another option would be to consider one of the um, um, uh, multi-kinase inhibitors uh, prescribed off-label by a, uh, a medical oncologist. So these would include uh, sunitinib or perhaps uh, fizopinib off-label. Uh, but the, the options are more limited after uh, vandetinib. Okay, thank you. So this next person writes in that they their calcitonin so preoperatively, the calcitonin and, and CEA were, were fairly high, 2,000 and 550, respectively. Okay. And then after their thyroidectomy, there it, it went down to less than 5 for the calcitonin and the CEA about 19. Well, now, about 8 months later, after that initial surgery, the, the calcitonin has gone from the 5 postoperative to 18. Mm -hmm. and the CEA has gone from a 19 postoperatively to 125. Mm -hmm. So their question is, what does this say about doubling time, and also what does it say about their prognosis? Yeah. So this is really exactly the situation where the, where the doubling time uh, information is useful. So um, the, um, uh, it looks it looks like this person had a, a very effective surgery in debulking most of their cancer, but you know clearly they have persistent disease, and there's been a relatively rapid uh, doubling time um, for both calcitonin and CEA, and um, so this is information that is concerning about prognosis even before it may show up on on scans. Um, so when we see this sort of thing, um, we uh, oftentimes will violate the 150 calcitonin cutoff and we'll start um, uh, imaging more intensely and a little bit earlier. So we'll factor that um, rapid doubling time in. Now, it, it's not in and of itself a reason to start a systemic therapy like Vandetinib, but um, you know, it it, um, it heightens one's index of s suspicion, I think, and um, it's important to stay on top of it, both in terms of blood tests and imaging. There's one other point that this brings up, Jan, and that is that the uh, in the immediate period after surgery, the calcitonin and the CEA do not behave identically. The CEA can persist and be elevated for significantly longer than the calcitonin. So um, one can sometimes get sort of uncoordinated changes between the calcitonin and CEA in the immediate postoperative time where the, the calcitonin may, say, go to undetectable and the CEA is still elevated, but then maybe at, um, at four months or five months, the CEA would finally go back to normal. So the next set of questions is going to get away a little bit from persistent disease and talk a little bit more about the basic disease. Okay. So how accurate is genetic testing so that we can protect our families? Yes. And 
a second question from a second person but related is, should children of sporadic patients have the test for the reputation? Yeah, so those are excellent questions, and I, I sort of tilted the presentation toward the persistent disease, but it, it's always good to talk about this. So um, the, the American Thyroid Association guidelines and the European Thyroid Association all agree that it's a good idea for all MTC patients, even if they have a negative family history, to undergo um, RET testing and this is of their blood DNA, not of their tumor DNA. And the reason to do this is to see if there may be hidden familial disease, even though the family history is negative. And um, a couple of studies have shown that the chance of, of passing it on, even though the family history appears negative, is about 5 to 6 percent. So it's, it's significant enough, enough that one would want to check for it. Now, um, the testing is not, the RET testing is excellent, but not perfect. Um, the, um, the current generation of tests pick up roughly 95% of known families. So if you take a known family with a family history, about 95% will be picked up by the current generation of tests, uh, the standard test. One could do even more detailed testing, um, but, but the standard test that's usually used would pick up 95% of those. The chance, though, for um, somebody with a negative family history and having a negative RET test of still passing it on to their family is not 5%. It's actually 5% times um, uh, times 5%. Uh, so it's a, it's a much smaller number. And then for an individual child, it would be 50% times that. So we're really talking about a couple of chances in 1,000 of the remaining risk. Um, I think it's a good idea for pediatricians to know about the, um, the family history and to do thyroid examinations and to talk to children about um, symptoms that could be referable to thyroid cancer and medullary thyroid cancer. But it's a small risk. And um, it does not do any good to do the standard RET test, again, on a child if the, if the index patient, the, the, the parent who's affected, is negative. That doesn't do any good because it, it's just relooking for the same sites in the RET gene. Um, so uh, to summarize, the, the RET te test is, is excellent but not perfect, and there's a small remaining risk for family members even after the RET test. The standard RET test is done and is negative, but it's a very small risk. It's a couple of chances in 1,000. I hope that answers the questions OK. I think so. Thank you. And so another question, now going back to uh, staying with the disease questions, is there any type of thyroid cancer that does turn into MTC? Oh, good question. Yeah, so um, we really think of the medullary thyroid cancer as being separate from the other uh, forms of thyroid cancer, like papillary cancer. Um, there are some rare cases in the pathology literature where there are tumors or even lymph nodes that have aspects of uh, or adjacent papillary thyroid cancer and medullary thyroid cancer. But we don't really um, think that they're um, related in most cases. And um, it doesn't seem like uh, other forms of thyroid cancer turn into medullary. So I'd say no. Now, there, for the familial cases, there is a pre-existing uh, state called C-cell hyperplasia. It's not a cancerous state, but it's a, a, a state of overgrowth of the benign calcitonin-producing cells um, caused by the RET mutation. And then that condition can turn into multifocal medullary thyroid cancer in the familial cases. Uh, but that's not really another thyroid cancer turning into MTC. 
Thank you. I'm going to just ask one more question and then wrap it up. So and this is a question that's frequently asked and talked about these days. Is there any known type of diet or nutrition that might decrease calcitonin? And then I kind of wanted to just uh, expand on that a little bit. And if it decreases or increases the calcitonin, does that necessarily mean it affects, it's actually affecting the tumor load? So um, this, I think this is a, a frustrating issue f for people because they want to take their health in their own hands and, and not be dependent on these things. Uh, but I, I really haven't seen evidence for successful dietary interventions that can either help the calcitonin level or help medullary thyroid cancer in a broader sense. Um, the, um, so I, I'd, I'd say that the answer is a pretty clear-cut no. There's, there's no dietary in that intervention. I mean, of course you want to maintain good nutrition, and if you're having diarrhea, um, you know, there's some dietary adjustments sometimes that help people deal with that better, and you don't want to become malnourished with diarrhea. Um, the, uh, there's one additional point about um, calcitonin changes and how calcitonin changes uh, relate to disease level. Now, I, I spent a lot of time talking about the calcitonin doubling time. I, I want to make it clear that the, the calcitonin itself is not harmful. It's really a, a neutral biomarker. And we, we normally think of calcitonin as reflecting the volume of medullary thyroid cancer or, or calcitonin-producing C cells in the body. Um, but there, there's some special circumstances where that relationship really breaks down. Um, Dr. Wells showed it very clearly in the Vandetnip study that when patients went on Vandetnip, their calcitonin levels would drop dramatically right away within a couple of weeks. And um, if the drug was discontinued for some reason, such as side effects, the calcitonin would shoot right back up. And then if they went back on the drug, it would go back down again. So clearly there's been, the calcitonin here is not reflecting the volume of the cancer. It's not like the cancer is growing and shrinking over those rapid time periods. But instead, the calcitonin is affecting individually the production of calcitonin in the cells. So that, that's just something to keep in mind, that although we think of calcitonin levels as being kind of inexorably linked to the volume of the disease, and, and from that aspect to, the, to how, how you're doing, um, there can be some disconnects, too, uh, like patients treated with these multi-kinase inhibitors. Uh, a drop in calcitonin maybe isn't always uh, as great as it, as it seems. Thank you so much for answering these questions and for the whole presentation. Yeah, I'm sorry more, uh, more questions didn't, um, didn't make it through in the time period. I guess some people are, are, are probably frustrated. Um, maybe we could, um, we could uh, offer, uh, you know, for people who didn't get their questions answered, maybe, maybe Jan, if, if you wouldn't mind taking, taking a few emails on this, and, and I, can, I can try to deal with more. I know at the at the FICA meetings, the questions usually spin out over a longer period of time than the, than the actual meeting. They don't they? <laughs> so um, if, maybe if there are a few key ones, we can, we can address them that way. That would be great. And so speaking of the FICA meetings, be sure to go. Everybody, be sure to check FICA.org, the website, to get the details of the national meeting, the national conference, the annual conference that will be in Los Angeles this year from October 14th through the 16th. And also on FICA.org, you can get the schedule of the upcoming webinars that will be featuring currently the ones that are scheduled are pertaining to the other types of thyroid cancer. But we certainly hope that we will have Dr. Ball back again for more on medullary thyroid cancer. And I think that pretty much wraps up our time. Thank you again, everyone, Great. for participating. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Gary.